This is one of my favorite topics, but I was a banker for 10 years. So I tend to think about how this stuff is all paid for and all the changes happening now in the finance side of the table. So I welcome you. This is session six, session 15. No, I'm backwards and my brain is not happening here. Financial bets, 2021, investing in trading and music session 14. And our wonderful moderator is Amy Baker from Winston Baker. Amy, please take us away. Thank you so much, Gigi. And thank you everyone for letting us uh, spend some time with you this afternoon. Uh, I am very excited to introduce my esteemed panelists and give you, uh, I'll let them give you a little bit of information about themselves and what they're up to, what they're doing. First, we have Vicki Nauman. She's the deal maker and connector, the founder and CEO of Cross Border Works. And then we have Anthony Martini, the former artist and a good disruptor. And he is the CEO of Royalty Exchange. So Vicki, I'll let, us, let you tell us about yourself first and then we'll go over to Anthony. Great, thank you so much, Amy. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, Gigi. Thanks for inviting us. Um, yeah, so I run my own consulting and advisory business called Cross Border Works. And I've been doing this since 2014. I focus on all of the industries that are just adjacent to music. And this includes, you know, app developers, technology companies, people who want to engage more substantially with music and either bring that into products and deploy those or just want business relationships. And so the finance industry is now one of one of these sectors that I work with. And a lot of a lot of what I do is help people make sense of the music industry because it's very counterintuitive and the things that you that you would logically think would be um, would be amenable to both sides oftentimes isn't. Um, but um, but I, this topic is near dear to my heart because I feel like this is you know this is yet another boost of confidence that the industry is growing and robust and um, and I'm happy to be here to talk about it. Thanks uh, uh, and uh, yeah thanks Amy thanks Gigi um, happy to be here yeah so I am uh, CEO of Royalty Exchange but uh, I got my start in the in the music business long time ago as an artist, but then transitioned into artist management where I managed uh, Tyga most notably for about 10 years but until I started my own record label called Commission. And from there I signed artists like Little Dicky and Made in Tokyo and uh, you know built, built an independent label from the ground up and, and sold it to some investors about a year and a half, two years ago. And you know my career has always been about trying to figure out ways to empower artists. And, you know, when I found Royalty Exchange, the platform was so disruptive in a good way, like you mentioned early on, uh, that, you know, it, it just took away all the pain points uh, that artists have, which mostly is, is financing. And, you know, that's the reason why they usually get into bad deals. Um, and Royalty Exchange seeks to empower artists by getting them funding, getting them, allowing them to leverage their IP, their creative IP and turning it into a real asset class, uh, which, you know, being, being on the artist side for a long time, managing, working with artists, like it's, it's hard for them to uh, get, get bank loans, do, you know, do anything to leverage their, their, their career because it's not looked at in the same way as like a traditional uh, asset where royalty exchange is looking to change that. That's great. We're going to definitely get back to that asset class conversation um, because I think that's very interesting and a lot of people will find um, so a new perspective on that once we get into that. But let's get into the, um, let's just start out with what's driving the demand and what's driving the supply right now. And, and we could start that off with you again, Vicki, and then next time I'll, I'll start off with Anthony. But right now, ladies first, what do you think, what are your thoughts on what is driving this demand and supply right now? especially in our current environment, right? Right, right, no, exactly. It's, um, I think, you know, I have to acknowledge Royalty Exchange because they were really the first company that I mm -hmm. met that was able to, to identify music in a, in a financial, as a financial construct. And this is something that I think a lot of industries that, that are out, even one degree outside of music, they look at it and they just say, this doesn't make sense to me. You know, there's, there's labels and, and artists who sign to labels and publishers and writers and splits and rights and management companies and, 
you know, recorded and live, all of these different things. Um, it's really, really difficult for anyone to understand all the different aspects and all of the different revenue streams. But I think that what has happened is on the, on the side of the money coming into the industry, that there has been through streaming a data set that has created a, a common language between the music industry and the financial industry. And most of this is coming because of streaming that we know we can look back and say, if we could look back two or three or four or five years and we can see patterns in the past behavior, then we can predict the future. And that enables financial companies to mitigate risk and to say, okay, this is not unlike other kinds of assets where we have been able to see past behavior determine future behavior. Um, the other thing that has really helped the financial industry come to the table around music is really specifically with, with publishing rights because there are there's an average of 600 different income streams globally for any composition. And when you think about that, that's an incredibly diversified income stream. And you have, you know, you have terrestrial radio, you have webcasting, you have synchronization, you have DS, you know, broad-based subscription services, advertising, and then every country has multiples of each of those. So you have a really risk mitigated income stream and diversified income stream with, with publishing. On the other side of it, there has always been this, um, there's always been this uh, of, uh, mantra of telling artists, hold on to your publishing, hold on to your rights, make, you know, make sure that you are not selling all of those, you don't know how much you're going to be worth and been well in the up and coming artists. But I think what we're also seeing is a, a, an incredible number of legacy artists who are just getting old and they may be getting to the point of not touring anymore. Maybe they, maybe they don't want to give their heirs, um, you know, a, a, a complex catalog to manage. Maybe they just want to give them money. Um, and so that was, you know, we first started seeing a lot of legacy acts, catalogs changing hands and individual rights changing hands. We're, and we're now seeing a, a pretty robust market even for established current artists. But we've got a really good perfect storm in the positive sense of there's money available to buy, there's a diversified income stream around music, and there's willingness to buy. And right now, the multiples of what especially writers and publishers can get for their catalogs are really significant. And I think that that's something we should talk about, which is, you know, strategic investors, meaning labels or publishers, are probably much more likely to be a bit more conservative on the multiples, whereas financial investors sometimes are coming at this and 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 just saying, yeah, we can, you know, we can, we can manage our risk and we can look at the future um, and we believe that we can make our money back. Um, so I think there is a, a slightly different lens, whether you're a pure, pure financial investor or you're someone who's thinking, am I going to integrate this and work this as a part of my catalog? But both sides are at the table and there's a lot of money flowing around on this and it's having huge impacts on the industry. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But now it's this turn. It's um, Anthony's turn to agree, disagree. Uh, what do you have to say there? <laughs> uh, I, I agree. She took everything I was going to say. So, you know, but uh, but um, no, I mean, I, well, to get to, to your one of your first points of, of, you know, the business being so confusing in the past. I mean, that's done on purpose. All, all the music companies want it to be confusing so that artists don't know how much money they're owed, how much, you know, what, what's, what, it's, it's, it's actually built to be confusing, but I think because of the, the digitization of everything and, you know, streaming being, uh, you know, leading that, but then just everything becoming more digitized, it's been, become a little easier to make sense of all the data. And, you know, also with streaming, it's, it's made it easier to predict out into the future, you know, what the earnings will be. So it's become a pretty, safe and attractive asset for, for investors because it's, it's not correlated to any of the markets either, you know? So no matter what's happening in the stock market or in, in whatever, you know, 
volatile environments they may be out there, it doesn't really affect, uh, you know, music royalties in any way adversely. You know, I think uh, Marty Bandier had a, a quote that said, uh, music and booze are uh, both, both are great businesses when people are happy and when they're sad. So, you know, it, that's, that's kind of what it is. Music has always been, uh, you know, an attractive asset for, for people in the music business, but because of streaming now, it's, it's become more of a, a safe, safe investment for non-music people. So like, um, can you delve a little bit more into Anthony about how this is the idea that music rights are an asset class? Can you get more into that? Yeah, I mean, well, so, you know, you're creating as a creative, your your value is in ideas. Um, and a lot of people, it's not a tangible thing often where people don't know how to assign a value to it. But because of, you know, all these mechanisms now and, and the data that we have to collect, you know, we can we can look at historical uh, earnings project into the future. So, so now it, it, it is a true asset where it's, it's almost like a bond, you know, and, and investors look at these catalogs as a way to get yield. They park their money in it. It's kind of like a bond, except at the end of the term, you could actually, you know, with a bond, you, you can't just resell it now where a music catalog, you actually can. So, so, you know, that's the way a lot of uh, institutional investors look at music rights is it, more like a bond type market. But then, you know, there, you're starting to see now the emergence of more speculative investors that want to invest in futures and, and sort of, you know, there, there's going to be different instruments, I think, coming out over the next year, two years, couple of years uh, of, of different ways to invest in music that aren't just uh, music catalogs. Very interesting. Vicki, you brought up a couple of times about the multiples. Maybe you can break it down a little bit for the audience, like how to understand the multiples uh, and how catalogs are being valued because there is that difference between the legacy and the current artists. Can you give a breakdown for the audience on that? Yeah, in, at a really high level, um, what investors do is they look at at least the last three years, if not five years of data. And so you look at that and you, you figure out what are the trends? Is the catalog, is the catalog going up? Is it going down? Is there, if there's a sync, like in a movie or something really high profile and ad, that oftentimes has a dynamic where it lifts the rest of the catalog and, or at, le at least it will lift that song. And we've seen this with some of the, the Netflix series and docu series on artists, where their catalogs in you know be, you know resurface in streaming services. So they look at patterns, and then it comes out to be an average of um, of uh, revenue per year. And then there is a every financial company has a slightly different way of looking at this, but they look at the and then you pay a multiple of that. So I've seen, you know, some companies have changed hands where it may be four times the annual revenues for the entire company. It may be, you know, we've seen some publishing catalogs to be 20, 25, 30, 30x. And so if you if you then take that one step further and you think, okay, well, if that if that income continues consistently then that's how many years it's going to take to recoup the money. So if you paid 10 times an and you know the average annual for a catalog, then theoretically if it continues to perform, it, you'll, you, you will pay off your investment in 10 years. So I think sometimes those multiples are, are paid because an it's those multiples are are paid because an investor might think well, this catalog is not being maximized so you know we want to really work it for sync we think it's going to be great for a movie about this artist's life or other kinds of monetization but ultimately that's where you're giving the seller a multiple on top of what their annual revenues are and then it's up to you as the buyer to figure out how you're going to earn that back Yes, I, I know that we, we've spoken about this before when we were back doing live events and these multiples kind of got blown a little bit out of proportion compared to what the, you know, the history had been and, and kind of like the model that you're talking about. All of a sudden it was like a whole new um, 
a whole new multiple. Like, I don't know where it was coming from. And I think a lot of people were kind of confused about that, but that's interesting. Um, so why don't we get into some of these, like the headlines that are happening and the M&A deals that are changing, you know, that are at the forefront of changing the shape of the industry right now. And, and Anthony, we'll start with you and get into, you know, you can talk about any headlines. I know at some point we'll talk about the Orchard Naval and all this, but you can start us off. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, to, to kind of uh, piggyback on, on the multiple conversation, that's always seems to be the biggest like metric that every every artist and manager wants to know, what's, what's the multiple I'm going to get? And, uh, you know, it's sort of misleading because the, 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 the deals that you see in the press, you know, often are these iconic catalogs that are old, you know, and uh, the fact is, the older the older the that the catalog or the song is the, the higher the multiple is going to be because you've already you know it's decayed over so so many years that now it's it's not decaying anymore and it's stabilized and you know if you're talking about a catalog that's potentially 30 years old yeah you could get a 20 time multiple on that because you know it, it like it's it's now diminished so much that the actual value of it is much hard, much higher but if you're a newer artist that has a, a newer catalog you know, usually you'll see because of the lag in payments, there'll be, you know, the first year kind of starts to go up, this, you know, around the second year, there'll be peaking and then it starts to go down. That's why, you know, three years is, is sort of like the minimum, uh, you know, tracking factor that we, we look at. But then, you know, after that third year, it's going to keep going down, you know, 5%, 5%, 5%, 2%, 2% over the next, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. So if you're a new artist and, you just had a hit song and it came out and yeah, you made a million dollars last year, but you know what? Next year, you're probably that million is going to become, you know, 400,000. Then it's going to become 200,000. So if you're trying to get a multiple on that million, it doesn't make sense because if you start to factor it out and project it into the future, it, you know, they artists, sometimes they don't, you know, they don't, they don't want to see the decay that's going to happen, but it's just inevitable. And uh, you know, that's where the whole, the multiple discussion could become misleading. Um, and then even with sinks too, like sometimes sinks, that's sort of an anomaly. Those aren't really, that's, that's not a, a, a revenue source that you could really count on year after year. Uh, if it's, again, if it's a classic catalog and iconic artist, they're probably going to continue to get sinks. But, um, you know, sometimes it's just, oh, you get one big sink and it's huge and it blows up and, you know, you might not get another big sink, especially on an older song for a long time. So sometimes that, you know, that throws throws a monkey wrench in the, in the valuations as well. So I think just part of educating artists and managers and, and, you know, mostly lawyers and business managers know they understand this space as well, but it's, it's the, the multiple game is not really, that's not the end all be all. You, you have to look at the age and it also cost. there's a cost to the money. Um, you know, if, if, if someone could tell you, I'll give you 10 years of your income right now and you're going to reap the tax benefits of capital gains tax as opposed to normalized income tax where, you know, that alone might save you a ton of money. It, it might make sense to do a deal, but to, to essentially get you, you know, your money front loaded now where you, you could go invest it however you want. You could buy real estate. You could, you know, you buy your own house, do whatever you may need to do, reinvest it in your career. There's a value to that as well, rather than having to wait, you know, over the course of 10 years for it to drip in. So, you know, it, it just depends on what the, what the motivations are to, to sell for sellers. But, um, you know, on the investor side, dollar age is a metric we use. And that's, that's seems to be the most important metric in terms of getting, getting the pricing that artists want. I think I wanted, um, I think that the concept of decay is actually a really, that's a really good one to talk about because I think that um, in an industry mm -hmm. right now, like even when I started working on this, five years ago with a couple of different financial companies, there was a lot of concern about streaming here to stay. Are people going to keep subscribing to these services? Is, you know, is the industry going to grow? Is it going to cap out? Um, and at that time, there was, there was a pretty aggressive decay that was placed on, on virtually, it was like a blanket placed on any deal saying this is going to this is absolutely going to decrease over time. And there's a, there's a norm in the financial industry to always put a decay on asset. But, um, but Anthony, what, what are you, what are you hearing now that we are actually in a growth? 
we're in growth mode with the industry and we have all sorts of more diversified TikTok, you know, Triller, all sorts of diversified music experiences that are out there. Is there still a norm around saying that any catalog is going to decay over time? Uh, yeah, I think regardless, they're going to decay even with emerging, you know, new sources of potential revenue. But, um, you know, the decay might be a little less, but it's still uh, it's still hard from the investor side to, you know, convince them why they should be paying more for something. You know, it, there's a, it's almost like you have to find a way for everyone to meet in the middle. The artists want the most money and the investors want the best value. And, you know, what Royalty Exchange does is we kind of connect both sides and we find the highest bidder for the music to, you know, to get the best price for the artist. But we don't actually, we don't actually buy it. We just mediate in a way. And so what we see is, you know, again, the, the investors are looking for their yield. They want to get the best value, pay the lowest, you know, lowest price. But if there's competition, they have to come with the highest price to win it. And then the artists are usually happy because they get, you know, they get the price they want, but no one, uh, you know, no one really wants to hear the fact that, uh, the, you know, the decay the rates are going to slow down because really they're not. I, I mean, even with emerging uh, sources of revenue, it's so fractional that it doesn't make such a huge difference in, in, in the grand scheme of things. So, um, you know, I think it's it, it's a pretty pretty consistent uh, rule. There's, a, there's actually an interesting question here from the audience that says, what about Spotify or Tencent Music? Do you think these platforms will elevate the community or only benefit the top 40 chart artists? Um, well, Spotify, I mean, I, like, I, I don't know if he's asking about it, just in terms of, you know, a lot of artists, a hot button issue is obviously like the, the per stream rate that, that these different DSPs uh, pay. And, you know, again, like with many things in the music industry, there's so many misconceptions. Like, so there is no actual rate for DSPs, it's it's none of them have a rate. They're they're all a calculation, um, and the calculations are going to change depending on different factors. There's no set rate, and there's you know there's discussions of like should there be a set rate? Um, you know, there's two sides to that as well. I think you know right now you haven't seen critical mass on any of the DSPs. Like more and more people are you know on them, and streaming is pretty ubiquitous. But at at this point, there's still people that aren't paying. They're using freemium services, stuff like that. And so as more and more people start to pay for subscriptions, royalty rates are going to, you know, get higher and higher. And, you know, the way that it works is these DSPs don't pay artists per stream. They pay labels. They, they, they essentially create pools of money that are allocated to whatever label has the most market share on the DSP at that time. So if, you know, if you're universal music and you have, more streams than Sony or, or, you know, like you're going to get the bulk of the money from Spotify and Apple. And then now you divvy that up amongst your artists, according to their contract. So, you know, the, the, the funny thing is it's the artists that I see a lot of, you know, legacy artists, established artists and young artists, everyone's, every, everyone seems to be pissed off at the DSPs about what they're paying. Really, you should be pissed off at your label of what they're paying because the labels are making money. That's what I try to tell people. Labels are making money off streaming. Publishers are making money off streaming the artists might not be making money off streaming because they're in shitty deals, you know? And so uh, what we always say at Royalty Exchange is, you know, we, we believe in ownership and empowering the artists. The, the more you own and control your IP, the more you're going to be able to benefit from it. The more you're going to be able to leverage it by doing a catalog deal, selling your catalog. There's other ways to make money off this now. And, you know, if you bet on yourself early and put in the work, you could have, you could build a really valuable asset. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, and, and I, I think that, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, the half a percent of the top, the, the top artists at the very, very top of the pyramid versus the long tail, you know, we've had, we've had, you know, every, every perspective on that over the last 20 years, as we have built this digital market for music. And, you know, at the outset, there was always this dream that there was a democratization and that there was going to be a really, um, a, a really strong long tail of music. Then we saw that kind of put to rest and say, no, it's only a hits driven, it's only a hits driven business. It's only the you know, major labels and it's only the few artists at the top. And I think we're going to settle into something 
kind of in between that because what we're already seeing, especially in places like Spotify, where they have a lot of playlists and users can create playlists, that it has flattened things out a bit. And there is a, you know, there's there's such a, a um, democratized layer to things like TikTok and YouTube where there's lots and lots of music that's being uploaded and used. And so I think music is always going to be a hits a hits driven business, but I think that we're also starting to recognize that that big fat middle layer of independent artists and niche artists and maybe artists who are not at the top of the billboard charts, but they have loyal fans, that there's all sorts of new business models that are starting to emerge and awareness starting to emerge about how can we structure deals around usage that might benefit those artists more than just the ones at the top. Because the one, the artists at the top are always going to be fine. They have, you know, they have managers, they have lawyers, they have entire teams that are looking after them. And it's those artists that are really, they're not necessarily just hobbyists, but they're professional artists, but they, they're, they're just, their music for whatever reason is a little bit more niche. That's almost exclusively all the music that I listen to. And so, you know, fans are really, really passionate, but I don't think we're, I don't think we're quite there yet on the bell curve of figuring out all the models that are going to work for all of the different artists. I just don't think we're quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think uh, I saw somewhere recently that the, the direct artist direct model, essentially just artists uploading their own stuff without even an independent label in between grew uh, 1% in the past year from like four to 5%, which 1% of the total market share of the business for direct you know, to artist to consumer music is that's a huge, that's a huge uh, percentage of growth. And, and believe me, labels and publisher, everyone is scared because they don't want artists to have the power themselves and cut everyone out. And, you know, that's what it comes down to. If you, if you own your IP and you're creating this asset, you could, you know, like you were saying, Vicky, there's, there's so many more ways now that you could leverage this as opposed to before. And, you know, social media has democratized things. There's, you know, you have all these distributors where you could upload directly to DSPs. You have companies like Royalty Exchange that could get you investment for your music. You don't have to sign a shitty deal anymore. Um, you know, your music is an asset and, you know, start acting like it. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's actually a great kind of concluding point to this panel, which is it used to be that if you were an artist, you only, and you needed money and you wanted to go into the studio, you had one choice, which was to go to a label and get a, you know, get them to finance it, get a bundle of services and hop into that more traditional music model. And some art, for some artists, that's still the right, that's still the right approach. But if you don't want to do that, if you, you know, money is kind of a commodity Get it from a lot of different places and there's you know there's there are tools that you can use different kinds of teams you know and, and where you get your money um you have lots of choices as, as an artist so i feel like all of this is really ultimately about artist empowerment it's just coming at it a little bit more from the financial side yes yes absolutely and vicky that's a great way to wrap up the the, the session Thank you to all the panelists and uh, great conversation. I'll use it in my classes. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to come back with our next panel after a two-minute break. Thank we'll you, everyone. Soon. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.